I just want to see something bigger than me I just want to travel the world I just want to meet someone different from me I just want to travel the world To see and smell and taste something completely new I just want to travel the world I just want to see it with someone like you I just want to travel the world, the world, the world Hello and welcome to the Our Offbeat Life Podcast. This is no ordinary travel show. Here, we delve into the extraordinary lives of intrepid families who've taken the leap into full-time travel. Each week, we bring you captivating stories from globetrotting families, sharing their triumphs, their challenges, and their incredible adventures. From practical advice on homeschooling on the road to inspiring tales of personal growth and transformation, we cover it all. Our mission is to help you, to show you that an offbeat life full of full-time travel is not just a dream, but a feasible, enriching, and exciting reality. And more importantly, we're here to provide you with the tools, resources, and motivation to take that leap into the unknown. So buckle up, because we're about to embark on an exciting journey. Let's explore the world together, one episode at a time. Again, welcome to the Our Offbeat Life Podcast. Here's your host, David Cole. Let's get started. Today is a real treat. As I had the pleasure to read a new family travel guide, and today I will talk to its authors. The Wonder Year is a comprehensive guide for families considering taking an extended break from routine life to travel the world. It covers all aspects of planning from initial inspiration to budgeting logistics to managing health and safety on the road real life examples from the authors, their own adventures while traveling with their children. It really helps bring the content to life. So whether you're still dreaming about or or ready to take the leap, this book will actually give you a chance to build up that courage and the tools to create your own family's wonder year. So a big hello to all the travelers and future travelers out there listening today. Um, I'm joined by uh, Julie Frieder, Angela Heaston, and Annika Paradise, the three voices behind this new Wonder Year travel guide. So, hello, ladies. Great Hi. to have you on the podcast today. Thanks, for, Thanks having for having us. us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, having had the opportunity to read the book prior to the interview, it's it's. I'm, I'm very grateful that I had a chance to take a look at this. I feel like I already know you guys a little bit here. Um So now it's really for our listeners out there to kind of get an idea of who you are. And I wanted to say that by reading the book, you will grow to feel the same, that you know these three ladies. I think this travel guide really helps to showcase who you are, your lifestyles, and show people that it's doable. So for those who haven't looked at the book as of yet, can you give us a little one minute or less speech about who you are. We can kind of start with Angela, then Julie, then Annika. I am Angela Heaston. I'm one of the three co-authors and I now live in Boulder, Colorado, but before my own wonder year, I lived in the Bay Area for almost 20 years where my kids were born and raised. I worked in healthcare and biotechnology and we made a decision to launch and travel full time. We planned a year and it ended up being two And at the end of that journey, we were deciding where to land. We landed in Colorado. I met Annika and Julie, and the collaboration started to write this book. That's awesome. All right. So, Julie? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having us on the podcast. Looking forward to this conversation. I'm Julie Frieder. I am originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. I've spent four years living overseas in different locations. And then a fifth year was our wonder year. Um, 
my background and training is environmental science and public policy. And I've had a chance to work in a variety of fields and sort of have realized lately that my career path was rather circuitous, but that's because I think I was following my bliss even before I took our wonder year where I really kind of cemented around that idea of follow what you love and that makes you work really hard and brings lots of meaning. So I've kind of done that professionally and brought me to this book and appreciate kind of that, the, the privilege of being able to do that. And, and this, this work with the book and with Angela and Annika is certainly in that same vein of following something I'm very passionate about. Very cool. All right, and Annika? Yeah. So thanks so much again for having us. And my name's Annika, and I am from the San Francisco Bay Area. I was a public school teacher. I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and I worked in student travel. So it was kind of all the stars aligned for me to want to take my kids on, on a wonder year. I also traveled a lot as a as a young child with my family. And I think I've, through writing this book, I've really realized how much it makes a family that time together on the road. And we'll talk more about that later. Definitely, definitely. All right. Well, you all have such unique backgrounds, different stories and what brought you to this. It, it really ties the book together, seeing so many different ways of travel and uh, lifestyles that build together. Before we really get into the book, though, I like to start things off with a little bit of fun. Let's have a little lightning round. <laughs> so you can all answer individually in your own taste, but coffee or tea? Hmm. I'm coffee. Okay. Coffee. Coffee. And I'm neither. <laughs> What's your preferred beverage? Um, water and flavored water, honestly, and a glass oh, of wine I, now and then. <laughs> oh, I do love flavored water from time to time. It's hard to find it down here, down in South America. <laughs> All right. Cat or dog? Dog. Definitely dog. Okay. Definitely dog. <laughs> All right. So we got dogs. All right. All right. Pool or beach? I'm beach. 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 All right. <laughs> All right. Now let's go this time. Let's say we're going to do an imagine or a would you rather. <laughs> so would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to teleport anywhere at any time? Julie. Uh, speak every language in the world. Uh, Annika. I think teleport. I I am a super big history nerd, so I would love to just insert myself places. Nice. All right, Angela. Teleport for sure. Whenever I've been asked what magical power I'd want to have, it's always been that one because you get to the good part and skip all the mess of the travel in between. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Very cool. All right, and a little bit of a weird one, but imagine getting off the plane at your next destination and you arrive into the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> You're able to get to your bag. What's the first thing you would grab and why? Well, Julie, you want to start this one? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I I'm always grabbing for my water bottle, but that's not going to get me very far. <laughs> Well, we I, do need to stay hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, my phone. Your phone. All right. Annika. Well, my first thought was duct tape. And I don't know why. I don't know what I do with duct tape in a zombie apocalypse, but it usually seems to solve most things. But hopefully, I've packed a hazmat suit. That's what I would do. <laughs> Well, duct tape is hard to bite through, so you might actually be okay covering yourself in duct tape. <laughs> I always travel with duct tape. Nice. All right. All right, Angela. Probably my camera, because <laughs> my camera is the first thing that I grab all the time to document everything, and I would imagine some pretty interesting things are going to happen if it's the zombie apocalypse. 
And if you would have asked me what would Angela have grabbed, I could have told you it was a camera. (laughs) Uh, So it must be always in your hand, that camera, ready to go. Yep. (laughs) That's cool. That's cool. All right. So now let's let's kind of get into the book here that you all wrote together. Wonder Year, A Guide to Long-Term Family Travel and World Schooling. Wow. Uh, I like to say that. It's a really cool sound for the book. Now, I really enjoyed it. It provided a, a good guide for families considering taking a Wonder Year or an extended period of travel for world schooling their children. Some people call it a gap year. I like the term Wonder Year better, though. Uh, it, it really encompasses it because it's so much more. Everything from budgeting, planning, closing up your life at home, educational approaches, health considerations, managing transition back home after traveling. It's, it's all mentioned in the book. It was probably kind of a feat to put together. <laughs> but in, in reading it, there really is a sense of who you are, as I mentioned earlier, and what you went through in the way the book is laid out. By far, my favorite parts of the book are the, the notes from the road those sections that each of you included throughout the book but then you also did a great job of mixing in real talk like conversations on inclusivity sustainability and responsible travel uh also there's wonderful sections tools that you provide such as jobs people take on the road where you mentioned the different types of jobs of world schooling families that you met that uh, that they were doing from the road uh, to the real life world schooling plans that each of you detailed in the book, which happened to be my favorite part, those those world schooling plans. So in writing the book, uh, first off, how did how did you all meet and decide to collaborate? And what inspired you to write this book together, sharing your family's experiences? Yeah, I'll take this one. So I left in 2017. And when I was getting ready to go, I I called on the people that whom I knew to help me kind of solve all those questions that were rattling around. And I knew Julie because our um, kids were in preschool together and we were in the same book club. And she she'll tell you more about her trip, but she um, did a different kind of trip than I was doing. But she had a lot of the answers to my questions. And then a friend of mine from high school knew Angela. And when I had told this friend that we were going to do this wild and crazy thing, uh, she said, I know somebody else who did that. And so I connected with Angela over that. And then she became part of our book club. And none of the answers that I needed were in one place. It was all in disparate pieces across the Internet. And so you could spend a whole lot of time trying to find all these things out. But it was really, I realized before we left that somebody should write a book about this. There's so many people doing it. And I was, I was surprised nobody had. And what they gave me, it was, also, it was the details and the logistics, but it was also kind of that pat on the back saying, you're not irresponsible for wanting to do this. Other, I've done it. Other people have done it. So it was that vote of confidence that was so important. And so when I returned, I said, no one's written this book yet. And then what started to keep me up at night was maybe I should write that book. But that seemed pretty lonely. So then I reached back out to Julie and Angela and said, what do you think about this? And they were all in. And so we also tried to write it both answering those questions that we all had and also trying to be that supportive friend tone to help other people who might be considering this. That's probably why I got that feeling that I, I I knew you all while I was reading through this book. It does have that tone to it. It's not just this boring guide that uh, you can follow. It does have a lot of really good sections detailed out and stuff like that, but it's, it also has stories and yeah. You really have that sense of community in the book, which is really cool. And I think that comes because it's a it's a collaboration with you three. So let's talk a little bit about some of those experiences, those travel experiences that you've all had. Julie, I know in the book that you did a lot of backpacking and everything from backpacking to RV life. There's tons of stories in the book. Can you tell us any funny or awkward stories about your adventures that may or may not have made it into the book? 
it's so fun to think about it because there literally were so many pivots. I mean, things that I would never have planned, like compound fractures of the elbow, you know, our dog got really sick, like crazy things happened. And yeah, so one of the things that I don't talk about in the book, and it, it's it's significant on many levels because it's kind of like that love of home and love of being away from home dynamic. We were in Boise, Idaho. We were going to have a meeting with the director of a river protection organization and the nonprofit, their office, they had this big TV screen playing live television and we're kind of glancing up there and they're broadcasting this epic flooding happening in Boulder, Colorado. And like they're flashing maps and I knew exactly where they were talking about. And they talked about this being a 500 year flood. And we decided as a family, we had a meeting and we said, you know, we're supposed to be doing this really cool trip up through the Badlands and then up a bike trip in New England and it's fall and all this stuff. And we all three said, we need to go home. We have to go check on our friends and our family in our house. And so we rerouted. And before we did, Johnny, who was nine at the time, said, but I have an idea. I think we should go back through Yellowstone. We had already spent three weeks in Yellowstone and had a fabulous time, but we didn't see wolves. And he said, I want to see wolves. He'd read about the reintroduction. So we took a little 500 mile detour or something like that, went through Yellowstone and it was like right out of Wild Kingdom. There was the bison carcass with a mama grizzly on top and the, the cubs wandering around and five wolves circling this scene. And we were mesmerized and we watched for like, I don't know how long, hours. And then this hilarious thing, we had our 85 pound dog with us and this new group of tourists showed up to the same spot because they also got word that this scene was happening. And they're all taking pictures of our dog. <laughs> We're like, you guys, do you know what's happening over there? There's this wild kingdom scene, but our dog was very handsome. And we joke about it to this day, like how photogenic Max was. But it was one of those things, you just never know what's around the next corner. And so we had so many pivots, but that's one that comes to mind. That is so cool. Yeah. And that's cool to hear because we were traveling to South Dakota back when they started reintroducing a lot of the wolves. And we actually went to Wolf Creek Lodge where they actually had some of the wolves that they were trying to, you know, they were raising, rearing and trying to release them every so often. We got to see some of them and meet some of the wolves before they sent them back out to the wild. But I've wow. never actually had a chance to go and like see them like driving along the side of the road before. That would be amazing. So, yeah. So now I need to make my way back out that way. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Where I'm actually going to Yellowstone this winter just because it is such a magical place, but never been there in the snow. So it's going to be a different adventure. That will be a different adventure for sure. All right. Well, now, um, Angela, we haven't heard from you for a little bit here. What's the most memorable human connection or cultural experience that you've had during your travels? You know, one of the things we talk about when, you know, everybody d tries to define world schooling and in our book, we do the same. We say using the world as a classroom. But one of the distinctions we, we've also tried to layer in is exactly what you're asking about, where we say it, it's so compelling to learn from people, not about people. And so the things that stand out to me, it's, it's hard to pick one, but we really did try to incorporate that across our years where we would go to a location and really try to connect with people. So a theme in our travels was history. I have two sons. They were both very into history at the time we were traveling. They were nine and 12 when we started. So we did a lot of historical monuments and museums and as often as possible connected with people who had lived through the history we were studying. So we met with a woman named Ruth who had lived through apartheid, who had been relocated, whose family had been split up and pulled back together and learned directly from her. We met with a man in Vietnam who had lived through the war, had been a prisoner of war, who guided us through 
um, some of his experiences there as we walked the sites. Um, so those are people who were designated guides, but it also just happened organically with people we met. So we just tried to be really, really curious and ask people about where they lived and who they are and what it's like in their world so that we could try to understand it better as we were visiting and spending time and trying to immerse ourselves there. Yeah, it's very interesting the connections you make, whether they're just organic or through, like you said, with guides and things like that as well. Really neat. And Annika, you had your travels with the Peace Corps before and then continuing on. I'm sure that's been ingrained in you. So was anything during your wonder year like this huge cultural experience for you as well? Well, you know, those human connections, I think for for our trip, there's parts of our own identities that um, kind of were that connecting point for us. So bringing my family back to my Peace Corps site and meeting my coworkers was a huge part of the, the trip. And I think, I, you know, my my kids got to see that I was more than their mom, that I actually lived overseas and I can speak Thai and a bit of Lao and Spanish. And that was, that was really cool for them to see me as a three-dimensional person. And I think it helped me become a better mom to kind of be reminded that I did have a life before being a mom that was separate from, from them. And the other big piece for us was my um, middle child is, is, was born in China and spent her first three years in an orphanage in southern China. And to be able to go back there was pretty life-changing. And it was really important to us that that happened. We not only got to visit the orphanage and meet her caregivers, but we also got to travel around China. And, you know, you hear so much negative talk about China in the news, but she now has this other um, kind of pride in China and being Chinese. That's really, that's really wonderful for her to have and to go through that whole experience. I mean, that's got to be a heck of a story in, its, in itself. Doing the, going back through that whole process after having already, you know, having her with her documentation and having all the documentation in order to be able to do that kind of a trip. Has yeah, to we, had to, we had to apply for a special permit from the Chinese government even to go into the orphanage. And we were only allowed like four hours and then we had to sign a book. But it was really life changing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it would be for sure. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. I've, only, I've only had... Th- Three days in China because we had a layover, and but it was an amazing experience. It's not exactly what you hear in the news, like you said. It's it's a totally different experience. They are very rich culture, so yeah, definitely cool. All right, now kind of changing gears into education and uh, staying with that volunteering, but you guys did a lot with your trip. So one of the things I found outstanding in the book was that there was no limits to educational opportunities. Uh, Each of you handled world schooling in your own ways, but you also found opportunities for volunteering and giving back while traveling. Uh, Julie, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your approach to education on your Wonder Year? Yeah, thank you. Really one of my favorite things to talk about when reflecting on, on our Wonder Year and on Yeah, just the experience. Because education was integral to the to every aspect of our traveling. So I would say we were pretty open in our overall approach. We did have some ideas around math, like some things that Johnny needed to 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 master his times tables while he was missing his fourth grade. But like you said earlier, you know, math was predominantly an applied fashion. He kept a log of our miles. He, you know, figured out fuel economy and did some conversion between kilometers and miles. And we can kind of, you can keep peeling back the layers and, you know, go deeper into any subject. But for writing and 
reading, we, we again sort of took a natural cue from wherever we were. We, we all kept journals. We, we wrote letters and postcards and letters to the editor. We read books about where we were and developed a really local reading list. And so it was very much organic in that way. In terms of the experience, we, we kind of opened up the opportunity. When we were in Alaska, we studied all about tribal nations and Alaska natives. And we, we met with a Chickaloon elder. So it became very personal. We studied subsistence fishing and learned about all the different five types of salmon while we were fishing with a subsistence fisher out of Haines, Alaska. We really just took those cues from where we were. So we studied climate change and its effect on glaciers when we were in Seward, Alaska. Um, but we tried to use two themes to hold it together. So I have sustainability as a background, and my husband is a hydrogeologist. So we really looked for water and sustainability as kind of this cohesive element throughout. And taking that one step farther, we affiliated with a nonprofit organization for the whole year. So we were effectively brand ambassadors for a nonprofit river protection organization. And it, it was really a wonderful way to learn. We were able to meet across the country with local river protection groups and um, learn about their advocacy work, learn about the science, learn mm -hmm. about the, the natural history. And being family ambassadors for this river protection group also offered a nice culmination project for Johnny. By the end of the trip, he had a lot of new learning and he applied to be a presenter in a poster session at a conference. So we went to the River Rally National Conference and he was able to kind of summarize his work and present it in the exhibit hall and talk to, talk to attendees and tell them about the state of river protection across the country. And of course, his, his experience traveling and being able to, to learn through this community service and taking this very experiential approach to his fourth grade. So it was a really nice way for us to be able to pull in our passion, our professional expertise, and then sort of the experiential arm of, of our of our education on the road. I love it. Yeah. It brings together your experience and you're able to put that put together with the experts that are out there and find your child's interest all in one and, and give them something to build towards. That, that's really cool. That's really cool. A, a lot a lot of our listeners out there are world schoolers or curious about world schooling and this whole educational approach of unschooling and road schooling and all these terms that you hear that go along with it. So and, uh, let's see here. I'm just curious, Annika, do you have anything that you would want to add onto that world schooling journey and types of things that you guys did? You know, we were similar to Julie in a lot of ways, but as I was a classroom teacher before we left, I was thinking as a classroom teacher when I first started, and then I could kind of pull back and morph it around. We did the same thing. We read a ton. And with three kids, you know, either my husband or I could switch off doing one-on-one -on -one reading with our kids. And, you know, I think there's no better way to do language arts than one-on-one -on -one reading with a parent. We did a lot of journaling. So our oldest was doing algebra. And that is really my upper reach with math. So we had to be very intentional about actually, you know, with a workbook doing algebra. But we also supplemented before we came home with a tutor before she started back to school. And I think that can sometimes relieve some of the pressure for parents when they're worried about being able to teach those, those subjects that maybe aren't as accessible to them for their memories. We also... You know, from hindsight, we did a lot of like physical education. We did a lot of trekking. We did open ocean swimming. We did surfing, all kinds of different things. We walked on glaciers. And so I think that there was a lot of, of that kind of education that I think gives confidence to young people in their physical abilities. And I want to also go back to the idea of being a classroom teacher, because when we were in New Zealand, we hunkered down 
in an Airbnb for two months and we had access to an English speaking library. We had library cards. And so we really used that time to kind of whiz through a lot of what I was envisioning for the year. And we would do like weekly spelling lists. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're, they're not going to like this. They loved it. They wanted some structure around their learning. And I think I only had the tolerance to do that for about two months. And then we kind of like no more school, but it was nice to have a time with some structure there. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, cause as a classroom teacher, that had to be maybe hard is what I was thinking that was coming to my brain for you to structure your mind around going this different route, especially with the physical incorporating into these physical stuff, the nature and everything else into it. So, yeah. So that, yeah, that, that definitely, that, that definitely scratched the itch. And then we could, they did book reports and all like, you know, research projects and all of that with the library, which was great, but it was only two months. Yeah. Well, neat. That's, but that's great. You can encounter all kinds of things along your trip to help educate and supplement education, depending on your areas of expertise. Mine is not math. I let my wife handle that or online programs that we find. That's not my area of expertise. I can do math just fine if I'm building something and I just can research with the internet and do that. No problem. I can build, but it's it's applied for me because I'm that kind of kinesthetic type of learner, you know. And so I have to pay attention to my child in my case. And I think that a lot of parents, if they learn their child's learning style, this type of lifestyle, even on the road, you can find a way to help your kid learn. Hey, David, can, uh, I, can yeah. I add one yeah. thing in the education thing, if you don't oh, mind? I'd love it. I am always filled with admiration listening to my co-authors because Julie's program is so cohesive and Ani's approach so leaned into her expertise as a teacher. But I feel like sometimes I represent the masses on this because I was not a teacher. My kids had been going to public school and I was relying on those teachers and I was starting from ground zero on planning world schooling. And so I just want to give a vote of confidence to the many people that I see post online about this because it seems to be one of those major hurdles for people to think like, can I do this? It's such a big responsibility to educate my kids, to pull them from school if you haven't already been homeschooling. So just very briefly, I did a lot of research around that, created a plan. The plan fell apart and it ended up being a beautiful thing anyway. And my kids were out of school for two years and slid right back in without any issue. So I just want to put that out there as like a testament to it can be done from somebody flying pretty, you know, starting from a pretty naive place because I see a lot of people struggling with that question. That's, that's very good to hear because, yeah, as traveling, I, I do, I encounter a lot of different teachers. Maybe that's also because I'm a teacher and then we find other teachers. But, yeah, you're right. There are a ton of questions online from people who are not teachers who are looking to getting into this. And they're definitely scared about the possibilities of how you do that. Um, and so coming from a teaching background like I do, I find ways to make it happen. But like you said, someone from someone from your background who didn't have that teaching background making it work, it is a testament that you, you can find ways to do it. What resources did you find to really help you before your plan fell apart and after your plan fell apart to get back on track and make sure your kids were successful? Yeah, as is my way, I did a ton of research up front, and that included, kind of like Ani was talking about earlier, lots of disparate sources online, homeschooling books, and most importantly, I met with other parents who were in my friend's circle who were homeschooling their kids. So I did all this research, and I, I created this plan, and it was like what kid would get what subject and when, and it was all worked out. And what happened was, is once we were on the road, that plan was getting in the way of actually really experiencing the experience, right? It was just better to be out the door doing things than sticking to the plan. And it, I'm talking weeks in, we were kind of like scrap the plan. What ended up working so well for us at, at the core was learning as a family. So rather than thinking of parent kid or teacher student roles, we really adopted a mindset of we are out here learning as a family. And what that meant was as we were deciding where to go and looking and learning about that place, asking questions about it, reading about it before we went, trying to understand it, um, 
deciding what we were curious about and wanted to investigate together. And then because we were doing that real time together, it just became this really fluid dialogue all the time. So we would go do something during the day and then we'd sit down at dinner and talk about who we met and what we learned from them and what our takeaways were. And sometimes pre and post, I would have the kids do little projects and like teach each other or even teach my husband and me, which was really fun for them to kind of switch roles. So it just became really fluid because we were doing it together and the roles dropped away. I'll say we kept a couple things structured just so that they could be prepped to to come back to school. We had the nuance that we were not leaving and coming back to the same place. We moved, so I didn't know what school we'd land in. So I wanted to have a little bit of language arts and math structure in place, but we did those kind of like Ani said, in condensed period of time when we were traveling in our RV and could have all of our stuff. And the rest sort of happened based on curiosity and serendipity. That's really cool. Yeah, I love that I, that approach of having the kids teach you, and they, they do a little research and they put something together. And I've had my son put a PowerPoint together here and there, and it's lo- it's lovely. It's lovely yeah. to see what they come up with. That's a great approach. So very cool. Very cool. It sounds like it really worked out well for your kids. So, and I think that the I'm, I think that our book is a great resource. Yeah, for education, there's a ton of ideas and how you can really approach um, the kind of structure of education from anywhere from just having an online curriculum that you're purchasing to really, you know, we're going to do math these different ways this month and language arts these different ways. We have like starter kits and uh, tons and tons of ideas. Yes, it's really cool. So people listening out there definitely you want to check out this part of the book for sure if, if anything for me i when i was looking through it the those guides is that, that instruction that in there is really useful because it's it's helped me kind of again think about it what am i doing with my kid why am i doing it with my kid and we found more ways to make i think incorporate new things just in the last what week or two since i've started looking through your book it gave me some so many cool new ideas that's nice to hear thank you Oh, yeah. So now what were some of the biggest lessons that you guys learned from living in a small space together as a family uh, for an extended period of time? I guess maybe Angela, maybe you can lead this one off. Sure. I think on the good side, what was surprising and such an aha for me was how much I actually loved it. <laughs> like, I love that amount of togetherness. I always say one of the most beautiful things about my Wonder Year experience was that my family ate every meal together for two years. And I would never, ever have that at home, right? We'd all be out the door doing our own thing. So the togetherness was amazing. We got along quite well. And we also made sure we found ways to carve out space, whether that be a person's alone time or some one-on-one time. So the importance of moving from a group of four to a group of one or two or three at times was really important. We got pretty creative about that. The RV we chose had a little section. The boys could pull a curtain and feel like they were in their own room. Parents were doing one-on-one time with kids. We visited family and friends along our path across the two years a lot so that our kids could mix in and kind of have their own thing every once in a while. So it's, it's sort of the combination of how amazing the together time was and the need to find space when it was time for people to have space. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, How about you, Julie? You have anything to say on that? Sure. We traveled for 13 months and we were mostly in the U S mostly in a 24 foot class B motor home at Tosca Navion that I loved and I miss it. (laughs) And, you know, we used to joke like, like, literally brushing our teeth at night, we would rub elbows. Like it was just pretty normal. (laughs) And just kind of being living, living that way. And, and we also had a tent. So we spent a lot of time, we would also pitch the tent and, you know, just camp or whenever we were back country, we would obviously leave the rig and, and just take our packs. But I think, you know, we just really started to appreciate the simple pleasures and that's carried forward. And you know, a hot shower is such a privilege, you know, and a hot chocolate sitting in the camp chair, you know, I joke, I felt like royalty, you know, there's just like the little things that, 
we took notice of probably way more than than we did before the trip. And that's carried over now that I still have that gratitude for for all these simple pleasures and how much that gives. I don't know, it just brings a little bit of joy without a lot of effort. And so, you know, and I think the other lesson is like just how when you're living that close to nature, like the boundary between us and the outdoors, it wasn't totally dissolved because obviously we had a rig, but it was like two seconds and you're outside wherever you are. And the ease and the permeability and the relationship we had with nature because of that has also carried forward. And today, my son, when he goes on a river trip, he doesn't even sleep in a tent. He just sleeps in a hammock. And I, you know, the, the, you know, the, the ease in the great outdoors, I think, and cultivating that practice came out of this year. And that's definitely one of the, one of the great lessons, you know, just being in motion and being so close to nature. That's, that's not only great to hear, it's awesome to see on your face, the joy. You can see your face light up as you're talking about it. So those of you listening, definitely, you want to check out the video here. But you can see how, <laughs> how much Julie's face lights up. And like, you can tell that this really meant a lot to you, this family time. And it looks like all of you had a great time on this trip in one form or another, you know, with the, with the kids, with the spouses, with everything. And you took many different ways of traveling as well. Like, Annika, what was your favorite form of transportation during the travel? Well, I know what my kids would say, hands down. Okay. And it's surprising. It was a 24-hour train ride from Chengdu to Beijing. And we were the only Westerners on the train. Before we got on, China has like snacks are amazing. And especially at the train stations, all the snacks we could get and everybody was going by with the different snacks. At all the train stations, we could quickly kind of get a new snack. But it was like being in that closed space like we're all talking about, looking out the window at this amazing countryside, eating snacks like no <laughs> meals, and just kind of meeting the people coming up and down the aisles. It was hands down the highlight for them. That's for me, cool. it was yeah. getting places by foot. I love hiking. I love, you know, even when we were in New Zealand, just walking around the neighborhood, like that is by far my favorite form of transportation. And... At Nepal, we went trekking. We went, you know, over 14,000 feet with the kids. And it was, it was an accomplishment for an eight and nine year old. Yeah, that, that, that height, that altitude is crazy. We had to do it in it's Peru. Ooh, it's yeah. nothing to joke about, especially for the young ones. So my, my son had a hard time when we got up there to what was it, about 5,000 meters. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. So that's really interesting. And you guys did so much. There's a lot of backpacking trips as well as families. So let's say here, what would you say is your top uh, for backpacking? Let's go internationally. Angela, you want to take that one? Uh, sure. I, I think you hear it a lot when you travel, um, especially when you're talking about long-term family travel, which is to, to pack light. Um, and I would say it's also pack smart, right? Because it's, it's really easy as a parent to think of all the situations and scenarios that you might come up with and that you might need this and you might need that and your kids might need these kinds of shoes, et cetera. So my family traveled in like three to four month legs, and then we would return to our RV and then go out again. And so we had the luxury of kind of regrouping on our packing when we went home. The first couple of times we went out of the outside the U S within the first few weeks, we shipped a box of stuff home <laughs> because we would try to put things that need were very gear, places that were gear heavy needs. Like we went to Iceland, we needed a lot of extra gear in Iceland, and then we would ship stuff home. The other thing though, is that people think you need to buy it all at home and take it with you. And it's just almost so much easier to find things on the ground. And you really can do that most places. It, it, 
many people think, oh, I can only get that in the U.S. And that's just not the case. You can almost always find what you need, not just buying new, but a lot of secondhand stuff too, especially for kids. So just being thoughtful about what you bring and I'll layer into that trying to work with your kids so that they can carry their own. So of course this doesn't apply to really, really little kids, but you know, as they get into even five, six and up being able to carry their own day pack or backpack and wheel their own luggage is huge, not only for convenience, but just that sense of autonomy. So I taught my kids how to pack their own bag. We used packing cubes and they would use those to organize and set up their space wherever we went. So just giving the kids some autonomy and being thoughtful about what they bring so that they can manage it on their own. So those are a couple of things I'd start with. That's cool. Yeah. Especially teaching your kids to do it themselves and uh, making sure that what they can handle, they can handle. So that's really good. Mm-hmm. I made that mistake early on on our first trip is trying to make my son carry his own bag and it was a little too much. So then we had to redistribute and or leave things behind. It was a little bit tricky at first. Mm-hmm. So it's the growing pains of becoming a new traveler. You offer packing lists in the book. I'll just mention that because mm-hmm. we made those really inclusive so people could be thoughtful about what might apply to them. But the idea of all those lists you see is to use them as reference and then choose from them what you know your family needs and how you travel and the kinds of activities you're going to be doing drive so much of that too. So yeah. it's a good reference, but it's it's intended to be a starting point so people don't forget things, but they shouldn't think that they have to remember all of those things. Definitely. And you make a great point that other countries have stores. Right. You can buy things. Right. They have diapers. You don't need to take a month's worth of diapers with you. They have certain medicine. You might need your more exotic medicines you might need to bring with you, but you don't necessarily need to bring aspirin. You can usually find stuff like that wherever you need to go. So just kind of think about those types of things when you're traveling. So that's okay. what we like to tell people too. So it's really because we, we learned that on early on as well. Go ahead, Annika. Yeah, and on the because uh, Angela and I spent – a lot of time internationally. And I actually had the opposite experience of Angela. Not not in that, you know, things aren't available, but we rented a lot. So in places like Kathmandu, you can rent things, which is great. And also when we offloaded some things, we met, like I had um, gators for, you know, there was, it was monsoon season and it was really muddy. And so at the end of that time, you know, I had these gators that I was either going to mail home. I didn't know quite what to do with, but I could just leave them at the guest house. And somebody else was, it's almost like a library. Like you could leave some items and people would take them. So that was awesome. But the thing that's really different from Angela is that I think for us in Nepal and going up to some very high altitudes, it was important for us to put our money in the local economy And there are so many people in Nepal who, you know, this is their profession. They're porters, um, some from the Sherpa ethnic group. And they, you know, that's what they do. And when we were there, it was an economic downturn. And they were so, so happy for the work. And they were so proud at what they could do. And it was a little alarming sometimes how much they carried, like with flip-flops on. But, you know, just to get your kids up to 14,000 feet, it's really, really helpful to not be, you know, just have a day pack, not the, all the medical supplies that we were bringing with us and things. Okay. Very good. I love that input. That's great. And, and Julie, you had a totally different experience too, because you were back country backpacking. Yeah. So we intended when we headed out to kind of just get away from where we were living to kind of expand our horizons as it were. But we really didn't go to many cities. We mostly fell in love with national parks and state parks and wilderness areas. And so we did spend a a ton of time and we did several trips within our trip. And so my couple points would be, and it's a through, this is a theme, I think all of us the three of us are in total agreement that wherever we can in every aspect of of travel, we found it super valuable to involve our kids. Like the life lessons part of the world schooling education is really unmet when you consider what children can learn through travel. The planning, 
the preparation, the decision making, the reflection, the problem solving, the fixing things. And so we, with only one kid, it was pretty easy to have him involved throughout. And so we, we definitely felt like, you know, he always had a seat at the table and was super involved. So we, we love to encourage where possible and in the right circumstances for families to really, you know, kind of create opportunities for kids to be involved in a meaningful way and that that, you know, pays off in a big way. So one of the things I would say is a 10 essentials kit, and it might be nine, it might be 12, but we got really into that kind of figuring out what are the essential things we need to always have with us and then making sure that it was packed really smart and that it was always with us. And I still kind of love that for being prepared. Another is to take a look at the International Dark Skies map, pick a place that's really dark and plan a trip there because short of like being an astronaut and getting to see earth from space, seeing the night sky without any light pollution is, can be life-changing and it's extraordinary. And when you're able to go for a couple days and get off the beaten path, whether it's, you know, getting away from roads and they just check out the map and plan a trip and go there. Cause it's, uh, super amazing. So we we went to several places that are that have that designation of international dark sky. That's amazing. Yeah, there's so many, and you can see there's a map of much, which is cool. The, the 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 dark skies map. It changed my life as a kid on wanting to see mm-hmm. dark skies because growing up in Idaho, went out to the desert in like outside of Nampa, Idaho, and you could see the entire Milky Way. And this is before Nampa grew and got bigger and more light pollution, but. Now there's different places that we've been from the Atacama Desert to down here in Argentina. There's several other places down here as well where it's just so dark and you can see everything with no lights around. And it, it's magical. That's kind of the word I like to use for it. It's just magical looking up at the sky. So I love that. So that kind of, that kind of like brings us to destinations because... Every traveler I've talked to has favorite destinations, favorite activities while traveling. You've all done something different. So let's start with, let's start with Annika. What's your favorite destination and or activity that you had? Well, you know, it's kind of like choosing your favorite child. It's hard. I think for world schooling in particular, my favorite destination is Greece for a number of reasons. I feel when I used to teach sixth grade, we would do a quarter to a third of the year on ancient Greece. So number one, it was my wheelhouse, like ancient Greeks, like I got you. And so every, I mean, it's such a pivotal piece of history, social science, and to have that come alive, I think for children is pretty amazing. And there's you know, temples to this God or that God all over as well. Then as we, when we traveled around the rest of Europe, you can see ancient Greece in all the, you know, art in all the museums in the British museum, all over France. It's, it's kind of um, ground zero, so to speak for Western civilization, but also the people are so warm and lovely. I like to say, you know, we were in this small um, marble carving town on the island of Tinos, I believe. And we were just walking through the streets and this older man kind of like patted the seat next to him and said, like, you know, come sit with me. And we just kind of gestured and giggled for, you know, it seemed like 20, 30 minutes, maybe it was shorter, but we just, the, the people want to engage. And um, that was really lovely. I feel like there's, you know, the magic of the ancient myths is so wonderful with, with kids. We wrote our own myths to try to explain the natural phenomena using, you know, the ancient gods and goddesses as, you know, as main characters. There's a lot to learn about sailing there. I could go on. But, you know, the other thing is the food. The food is amazing. And 
also, you know, studying health and it, like a Mediterranean diet, there's, it's just a fascinating place. Yeah. No traveler can talk about their favorite places without talking about food. I mean, no. traveling, it's all about food. <laughs> yes. I, I think yes. that's got to be either number one or number two on people's minds when they travel is the food. <laughs> yeah. But I think Greece has got to be on one of my uh, on my bucket list. It's definitely on my son's. He's a huge fan of shout out to Greeking Out the podcast, his favorite, and he's listened to every episode. So I know that when we end up getting to Greece, everything's going to come up. He's heard all the stories, and yeah, <laughs> so that's going to be amazing. Uh, Angela, how about you go next? What's your favorite? I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and do two favorites um, because my family. I feel like we're sort of, we live at the two extremes. Like we like to get out in nature and we like to go way, way, way out, like way out to the edges where it takes a long time to get there and you're way off grid. And my favorite in that is where you just came from, which is Patagonia. I love that region so much. I've been there twice, once on the Argentinian side and once on the Chilean side. And we spent a fair amount of time there in our world schooling years and it always feels like home. It's so strange. It's so incredibly distant from where I grew up and different, and yet feels like home. There's something about those outer latitudes that always sort of speak to my soul. And it's the kind of place my husband and I have even said like, oh, it'd be nice to live there part of the year. So anyway, we hope to do that. On the other side, our family also really likes busy cities. Like we really like dense, big cities full of culture and the hectic feeling and museums and street art. And, and so we've been to a lot of big cities and, but our, I think our favorites and one of our favorite places in the world was Japan. Japan is probably the biggest surprise of our wonder year. We all wanted to go there and we're curious about it, but four out of four of our family members went there and fell in love. There's so many nuances to Japan that are different and beautiful and interesting. The community aspect of Japan really appeals to my heart and they really savor art and culture in a way that I think is different than a lot of places that I, that we all really enjoy. So those are my two. Oh, some good suggestions right there. Very good. <laughs> all right. So Julie, can you wrap us up on this one? What's your favorite destination or activity? Sure. Well, and I love hearing Annika and Angela talk about it. <laughs> my list of places I need to go just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. Okay. So we harvested olives at a, at, in Calatafimi, Italy, in a hundred year orchard. And that was pretty amazing. It's a tip for folks who want to do work exchange. We woofed. There's lots of cool work exchange opportunities. We provide a whole lot of resources in the book that can help people find um, fitting activities that you can do that. We also did some kayaking, sea kayaking in Southeast Alaska yeah. and ended up at this crazy pristine cove. But those were not my favorites because my favorite places were the spaces in between where we were simply travelers and having that experience uh, took us being on the road for an extended period of time to kind of settle into that identity. And that's it. That's nice. <laughs> I, and I would agree. One of, when people ask me like tra traveling and your favorite stuff, I usually go with the drives in between mm -hmm. as I'm driving from one location to another. It's totally different. And then going by a plane and then just going to the main destination, seeing the, that temple and getting back on the next plane to the next place. Mm -hmm. I love driving because I see the rolling hills and the tiny villages in the back backwoods and everything. So it's really cool. So I love that. All right. <laughs> so now what about, I would say, challenges? What kind of challenges have we encountered along the way? Annika, do you want us to start with that one? Sure. I think I think that what some of the biggest challenges for us, especially our oldest, turned 13. And it was hard to be away from kids her own age. 
I think that was really challenging. Um, we did, you know, this, this was like early days of Zoom. So we did some Zooms and we tried to get her, when we were in New Zealand, she was on an open ocean swim team, surf life rescue, they call it. So she could meet some people. When we were in Costa Rica, we were in the same place for six weeks and she met some people in a Spanish language class. But I think that was the hardest thing. I think my two youngest, they're just one year apart and they were really still happy to just be us. And my oldest was too, to some degree, but I think she really missed that peer interaction. I think that was the trickiest thing. Okay, okay. Does anybody else want to add on to that big challenge? Any big challenges? Well, for ours was coming back. <laughs> and yeah. so I don't know if we want to go to, to talk about reentry yet, but for us, we yeah. were coming, I mentioned earlier, we were, when we traveled, we were looking at where we might land when we were done. So we were going and physically checking out places and also reflecting on what mattered to us as a family so we could decide. And when we came back, I mean, it always would have been hard to end this beautiful journey and, and reintegrate into quote unquote regular life, whatever that means. But we did a lot of things wrong. I'll just admit that we landed, we didn't spend time in the place. We bought a house right away and we got our stuff out of storage and we enrolled in school and signed up for extracurriculars. And just all of a sudden we were back to where we had been before we went on this journey. Oh. And some of that we had been trying to shed and leave behind. And so why I thought that I should set up house again, if you will, the way it looked before. I mean, that was just, it was, it was, uh, it was an error. It was not reflective thinking. And six months in, then I could see all of that, but we were already kind of locked into some things we could committed to. So what that meant for us as a family is we spent the next year or so undoing it all again. So we landed, integrated, got locked in and then sort of undid. And so, you know, with hindsight, I definitely would do that differently. And it was, it was bumpy. It was a bumpy ride. I mean, there were many beautiful things that happened too. We landed in a new community that was welcoming to us. I met wonderful people. I made these friends that I wrote a book with, but it was bumpy for all of, all of us, all four, two adults, two kids. And there's some good lessons there. And I've tried to share some of that in the book. Yeah. I can't imagine settling back in, doing the return and uh, anything. I mean, we've, we've thought about getting, you know, a, a kind of like a, like, like a home base, and doing things from that way for a little while down the road. But yeah, settling in for a long time or going back to the U.S. for a long period of time or forever, this doesn't seem on the radar yet. I can't imagine what you guys uh, went through going through this this part. Um, how about you, Ann? Uh, how, how about you, Julie? You mentioned in the book a grieving at the end of your Wonder Year trips. How did you work through those emotions when you returned home? Yeah, I mean, hearing you say that, it sounds a little melodramatic, but it really was hard for me. I came home also, I had, you know, in the 12th month of our 13 month trip, I, I fell like we were in the back country. I went for a trail run. I busted up my elbow and ended up having surgery and had this big old brace when I came back. And also the job I had before I left, it went away. My yeah. husband and son, they went back to whatever soccer and, you know, school and work. And I, so I was definitely in a funk and I, I missed the time freedom deeply, you know, and it took me a while. And I, you know, I think about it. Would I have wanted to know? We have a whole chapter in the book on reentry and it was profound for us to write it. And, you know, we wondered, is it, we don't want to like overstate it because I don't, for some people, maybe it'll be a super easy return, but I, I kind of wish I would have been a little more prepared. I don't know exactly what that looks like. You know, we have some suggestions in the book, like think about, don't burn any bridges, you know, reach out, reconnect, like keep lines open. And that's really, really important. But, you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't, it was, you know, I, I say it, it wasn't bitter coming home. It was sweet. Like we just pulled into town. We didn't have a plan. We like rolled up to our friend's house and just turned off the engine and got out and had a huge hug. And I was like, okay, our friends and family launched us on the trip and they were the soft landing on the return. And this is home. 
and it was beautiful to come home. And to me, the lesson is read travel books, hold, hold on to the traveler's mindset, you know, take a pause. Let's put our phones away, live in the moment, listen to that person's story. Cause they have a really cool story. If we take enough time to ask and let's enjoy the simple pleasures and all those things that make traveling so magical as a family, we can try to kind of hold on to that back at home. But for me, it wasn't bitter coming home. It was just hard. And I would have done, I, I mean, I wouldn't have changed it. I would have, it, you know, it, it was just, I, I missed the time freedom and I missed the, it was the best year of my life. And yeah. So, but I don't want to be negative. I don't want to turn people off. I mean, it's just, it can be hard for some people and for other people, you just slide right in and consider this a tip, like give it a little bit of thought because it can be complicated. And I think that, I think that everybody listening understands that, yeah, it's a unique situation, especially you're gone for a year, you're gone for two. I've already been gone for, by the time I get back to the States next year, it'll be five years and I'll be visiting and then leaving again. But it, it, it adds up. I've met people who've been on the road for eight, 10 years. And I can't imagine settling back down after that, but it's doable in the right circumstances. And like you said, you have that support group, that net network, as long as you don't burn all the bridges before you leave, it can, it can be good. And you could find that new community that you really want. And that's, that's what I normally hear. Uh, people finding the community and deciding, oh, you know what? I just love it here in this little town. We're going to stay. We're going to do the repatriation in this place or whatever, that type of thing. And you've probably heard some stories from other folks as well of being in the communities. So that kind of brings me to the other thing. There are a lot of assumptions out there about this lifestyle. So, Annika, what are the most common mis misconceptions that people have about extended family travel, in your opinion? I think the biggest misconception is that it's just super wealthy people. You know, you have to be a bazillionaire to be able to do this. And there's so many different ways that people make this happen. You know, we are small business owners. And so we really worked with a manager who could take over. And so we couldn't do, ex you know, open-ended because we needed to get back to run the business, right? But people, you know teach remotely. They, there's all kinds of remote jobs. There's every budget under the sun is, is available to, to world schooling families. Yeah, I think that's the biggest misconception. And we, we interviewed so many people. How do you do this? How do you make this happen? And we do like, you know, different scenarios of people's budgets and how they make it, how they make it work. Very neat. Yes. Very useful. Very useful. All right. Now, Julie, what mistaken assumptions did you have before departing on your trip? So I thought we were just going to hit the road and go for a, a year. And, you know, it was very romantic, you know, this big idea. And life just kind of happened. And we had came back, I said earlier, there were floods. So that brought us back through Boulder. Uh, my husband's mother is aging and, you know, we wanted to come back and check on her again. And there was one other stop that brought us back because life just kind of dishes itself out. And I thought at first, like that's going to somehow take away the significance of what we did. And that was a huge misconception because there's no right way to do this. It doesn't even have to be a year. It doesn't even have to be a month. You know, we call it a season of discovery. That's how we define wonder year. And so it's available in so many ways and so many forms, like Ani was saying, it, it's, it's the intention to get into motion as a family and learn side by side. And that is the season of discovery we talk about. So I think that is both sort of a misconception I had going in, but a, a way bigger, more important lesson coming out. Yeah, you'll learn a lot. That's very cool. And then Angela, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about yourself during your travel? 
Um, I think it probably would be how living that simply on the road felt the most aligned with my personal values that I'd ever felt in my whole life. I think back to when I first met my husband when we were in our 20s and we connected based on a love of adventure and curiosity and education and constant learning. And somehow over the years, the noise of life was getting in the way of being able to really tap into those things. And so when we left, the intention was to try to get back to the things that had mattered to us most. And that was so affirmed for me traveling. I mean, I, I just on a really personal note, I'm a caregiver at heart. So I first take care of all the people around me. And I know many people can relate to that. But I also found that I have a lot of noise in my life taking care of stuff and processes and things to do at home that just, it, I mean, I just, there's no better word for me than noise. And so being on the road and kind of stripping all that away and just getting back to what I love and kind of having all my senses turned on and doing that with my people that I care about and love the most really made it clear that that's the way I want to live. And that's how, what I've tried to incorporate across the years. It's kind of what I was talking about earlier with the landing back and complicating our lives again. And what it does is it gives me direction now to know those things about myself and have, have made it really clear what matters and how I want to spend my time and my emotional and mental and physical energy. Very, very sweet. All right. And do, do any of you have any regrets about taking this wonder year? None. No. Zero. No. Uh, <laughs> I love to hear that. That's mainly for the listeners out there. I mean, people who take a tri take these types of trips, even if bad things happen to you on the trips, you almost never regret these things. Mm -hmm. There's so many positives that come out of it, as we've heard from all of your wonderful stories today so far. <laughs> And David, oh, I'll just mention that we interviewed many, like dozens of families for our book too. So we do bring our perspectives in, but we really wanted to learn from others and represent their voices. And we always ask that exact question of them. <laughs> and I think across the board, it's no regrets. You'll hear the stories of the people who decided to come home early or something wasn't working and they made a change, but regret is um, not a, a word that gets mentioned often. Not, not often at all. And over the course of this season here on the podcast, we've talked to people who've had all kinds of things happen to them from marital issues to medical issues to breakdowns and breakups and the whole gamut. But all of them tell me that they don't have regrets, that these things probably would have happened in some regard or another in their life anyhow, and that these stories, these Hundred bad days, as the song goes, lead to wonderful stories that you can tell forever and memories that will last a lifetime. So, I love yes. that. And thank you all for writing this book. It's it's a really good compendium as well as you know just guidebook as well. So, and there's no right or wrong way, no way. To, to go through the book, as you guys mentioned, and the foreword. You can use it in the way and the order that you want to, not for not necessarily in a linear order. Find what you need, use that, or read through the whole thing, or just pick and choose. So it's really cool. So be before we go and before we get your parting thoughts, I always like trivia pursuits. So I want to do a little trivia time here. No, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> I'm feeling nervous. Okay. Well, you got you have three brains. So let's see, let's see. <laughs> All right. First question. What is the largest country in the world by land area? I think it's the Soviet Union, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes. Yeah. Russia. Yeah. Soviet Union, Russia. Russia. Very good. All right. <clears throat> Can you name the only city located on two continents? Istanbul. Istanbul. Yeah. Very Istanbul good. was Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul. That's very good. <laughs> bonus, bonus question for that one. What two continents? Europe and Asia. <laughs> yes. Very good. <laughs> All right. What's the world's smallest country? It's the little one embedded in South Africa. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. Thank you. No, I think it's the Vatican City, right? Oh, oh Vatican right. City. Right. 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 Good call. Cons consensus is? Vatican, Vatican City. City. Yes. Very good. <laughs> 
All right, and uh, let's see here. Which country has more lakes than the rest of the world combined? Finland? Not Finland. Darn. It is a northern country, that's for sure. Canada? Canada, yeah. Mm. I know. That one caught me off guard. I didn't know that one at first. <clears throat> and last, can you name the largest ocean on Earth? Pacific. Pacific. Yeah. yeah, the Pacific. Very good. All right. You ladies did very well with the trivia pursuit. <laughs> All right, so i like to also finish up with some advice for others and your long-term impact. So, Annika, if you could start us off here. Now that your kids are a bit older, how do they reflect on your family's wonder year looking back? Well, my oldest is now studying marine biology at the University of Hawaii, and we live in Colorado. So she got that passion for the oceans during our wonder year, we spent a lot of time near the coast. So I think that's one of the major impacts for sure on her. I would say one of my biggest takeaways, well, there's a few, is that it kind of goes into the philosophy of the Peace Corps, that when people actually get to know each other, from different walks of life um, that promotes peace. And so I find that, you know, again, we hear so much about, oh, we should be worried about China. And I know that's like a global issue, but I think we also can think it's it's the people sometimes. But one of the, the biggest takeaways for my kids, hands down, was really that everybody in the world is good and kind. And if they learn nothing else, they, they never learned algebra and they knew that in their heart, that's all that was needed for me. People are not the, the same thing as the country and everyone is good and kind. And with that, my son would always, he, he said this one time and it was very profound. He said, you know, mom, when people are, do things differently, the way they go to the bathroom or what they eat for breakfast or all these different things, you know, sometimes they think that the way we do things is weird. But nobody's weird. It's just different. And I think that my kids carry that with them when their interactions with people um, from different cultures or just different backgrounds, that there's no such thing as weird. It's just different. So profound and uh, beautiful. That's the statement. I love it. So let's move on then. Uh, Julie, what advice would you give to a family considering traveling full time in an RV with kids? I would say go for it. There's, we are all so busy and there's so little boundary between personal life and work life and home life and everything that has to happen and with the technology infusion and everything else taking over, it seems almost unfathomable that you could create space or that it would be the right time. It, it, it has to be, you ha we have to make it the right time. And, and then the, the trip can happen. And like we've said, and we said throughout the book, it doesn't have to be a year. It might be a week to start. But to, to have that chance of, of, of travel as a family, it's, it is well worth the effort and the trade-offs. And I would just encourage people to find a way to do it in whatever space that you have available to do it. <laughs> Excellent advice. All right. And then Angela, bring us home here. Now that you're settled in, after your adventures, what is the biggest way your wonder year shaped your family or perspective? Hmm. Well, I think what the wonder year really highlighted for us is how important it is to be open and curious. I feel like our family uses that word curious a lot because it's sort of the pinnacle word that leads to other things. 
it's kind of what Ani was talking about, like being curious leads you to be compassionate and empathetic and caring and inquisitive and it helps you connect with people. So I just think that that has become such a central theme in the lives of the four of us. So that's playing out in different ways. It's playing out in what both of my children have studied at school and what they want to do and their perspective on travel and where they want to spend their time and the lives they hope to build. And even in what my husband and I are now planning to do in, in our futures as we embark on years where the kids are out of the nest. So I think travel and curiosity are intimately linked. And if you are curious about people and what drives them, what they care about, how they connect and what their cultures offer them and can offer others, it makes for a much more textured, interesting life for you too. Excellent. I love that. that was, again, very beautiful. There's so many things that people can learn from just listening to other travelers. And that's kind of why this podcast exists in the first place. Give people that opportunity to hear this. If you're on the fence out there looking to go into this. You're hearing from family or friends that it's a little crazy. You're hearing that you know, the crazy folks, they make it work. <laughs> we're not all crazy, but we're also not normal. <laughs> but that's not a bad thing either. <laughs> So, we like to say that too. There's a community waiting for you if you're thinking about doing doing this and living this way. There's a community of people waiting to fold you in. Yes. And you might find that that community back home, once you start doing this, they they fall in line with this as well. I've met so many families who travel and their friends have come and met them in certain places mm -hmm. or they, their their family has come as also as as well. And so people come along and your family and your friends, they, 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 they will support you on your journey if they're meant to be in your life for, for that long period of time. So, mm -hmm. so again, thank you, lady. Thank you. Thank you. Again, it's a great book. I definitely recommend it for those out there, The Wonder Year. This is really a journey to and a testament to the power of stepping out of your comfort zone and embracing the world uh, as your classroom, as your home. Um, we hope the these stories, really, these insights have inspired you and they've sparked your curiosity or perhaps even nudged you closer to your own adventure. As I like to say, life is a journey. It's not a destination. So everybody keep exploring, stay curious, and never stop learning. So until next time, everybody, thank you very much. Safe travels. And ladies, again, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to have you on the episode. So, thank you, David. Thank you Take so care, much. Take care, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Bye bye. Bye. I just want to travel. I just want to travel. I just want to travel. I just want to travel.